Call upon the Lord. That's what I want to talk about today. When people started to call upon the name of the Lord, this goes all the way back to Genesis 4.26. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, who are these people? And in the scripture, it's referring to the descendants of Seth. And Seth actually means, his name means appointed. Well, why would we call upon God? I mean, there's some obvious answers, answers to that. But um, let's look at the scripture. Obviously, there is no one else to turn to in times of trouble. And trust me in your times of trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will give me glory. Be our strength each day and our salvation in times of trouble. God, of course, is unlimited, and we all have heard the term Shaddai. That's what it means. It means that he is omnipotent. He is the Almighty One. That is obviously why we would call on God. Why else would we call upon God? Several reasons. He wants us to. He expects us to. Psalm 79, verse 6. Pour out your wrath on the nations that refuse to recognize you, on kingdoms that do not call upon your name. Romans 10, very familiar verses, 12 and 13. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He also desires and deserves our worship. 1 Chronicles 16, 29. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come to worship him. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. And then from the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 7. Fear God, he shouted, that he is a mighty angel. Give glory to him, for the time has come when he will sit as judge. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and all the springs of water. We say all these things, and as Christians, we can resonate with what the scriptures have said. But we live in a culture that has changed. It's not the same culture we lived in 50 years ago. It's definitely not the same culture we lived in, well, maybe none of us, but that existed here in the United States 100 years ago. Um, so there's a culture clash, but that has been the case since Christ came. That has been the case since Abraham was called out and the Jewish nation was established. Part of our culture in the United States from its founding has been the word of God and belief in our sovereign God and Jesus as Christ the Lord. That is in our founding from the beginning of this nation. But we have experienced a culture shock. Now, in the past, the culture shock, I think, can honestly be said, was for the person who had not been exposed to Christianity, not been exposed to the Word of God, not been exposed to the church and her teachings. But things have changed in modern day. It's been flipped. And today, at least as far as the media seems to present and is concerned, the culture shock is on the other side. And whenever a Christian speaks out, they want to, be, uh, to demean what is said. They want to run it down. And so there is a culture shock now when Christians actually speak the word of God. We've taken the word of God out of our schools. We've taken the word of God pretty much out of our society. We've taken the word of God out of our governing bodies. And it has been taken out in some places of the church. Not this church. The word of God is still regarded and revered. And I want to talk about that term. For many of us, who are Christian ministers, 
I don't like the term reverend because there is only one who is to be revered, and that is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That is our God. That is who deserves reverence and who deserves to be revered. God and God alone deserves that. So let's revere him. The word does. It says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Psalm 33, verse 8. The highest angelic powers stand in awe of God. He is far more awesome than those who surround his throne. Psalm 89, 7. Can you see that? The highest angelic powers we would be in fear and trembling should they appear before us, and yet they stand in awe before Almighty God. And then Psalm 50, the Lord, the Mighty One, is God, and He has spoken. He has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets, from Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines in glorious radiance. That last sentence, he is where beauty is perfected, and yet in that beauty, God shines forth in glorious radiance. Should we revere him? Absolutely. That's the way it should be. Is that the way it is? It's very disturbing when we look at our culture now. And yes, I have a culture shock when I see how improperly God is referred to, how the scriptures are disdained, how they take his name in vain, it's very disturbing because we're talking about the God of all creation, the God who is holy, the one and only true God. He is God, there is no other. And the epitome of his creation, humanity, it was bad enough that they spat on and beat, flogged, and crucified his son. But then to see it lived out again now in our culture, a nation that was founded on freedom of religion and literally on the Bible and its Christian principles, now disdains God so publicly, except in churches like this one. Well, let's think about something that goes right along with revering him. And it really needs to be part of the definition. And it's our worship of him. Worship means to honor or reverence as a divine being or supernatural power. Well, that's what we do when we come here and we worship him. We worship our God, the only supreme being, the only supernatural power that has complete and total due of our worship, none other. To regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion, that's what we should be doing when we come here and worship him. Oh, my people, listen as I speak. Here are my charges against you, O Israel, or today we would say, O oh, church, I am God, your God. I have no complaint about your sacrifices or your burnt offerings that you constantly offer. Now this, of course, is Psalm 50, 7 through 8. It's Old Testament. So we would say, I have no complaint about your sacrifices of praise that you constantly offer. Well, praise God. <laughs> That's good. Now let me ask you something though. Is the Christian life supposed to be easy? I see you shaking your heads and the answer is no. Yet there is some view out there 
mistaken because they do not know the word of God, nor do they read the word of God, and they think, okay, if I give my life to the Lord, everything's going to be great. That's not what the word of God says in any way, shape, or form. I will tell you this, your eternal destiny will, will be great. It will be beyond your imagining and beyond your comprehension. It will be glorious. And for those who do not serve God, it will be just the opposite of that. But we live under the same sun. We live, live under the same weather. We live on the same earth. And humankind as a whole is fallen. We need a savior. God sent his son to be that savior who paid the price. The only way sin is uh, taken away is through the shedding of blood and Christ did that with his own blood. Well, the Christian life according to scripture will face persecution, it will face hardships and the uh, same rain that falls on the evil falls on us. And that, of course, means that all the things that happen to those who are not believers happens to uh, believers as well. We live in a fallen creation. We have to understand that. But the difference is we have somebody who will help us to go through it. Praise God. Amen. His spirit is leading us, guiding us, strengthening us, empowering us to be able to live. Well, what did God Get, what did God provide us as our help? I just mentioned it, his Holy Spirit. It's not just his spirit, but it's also his holy word. His word is preeminent. And when I preach, you may wonder, why does he use so much scripture? Because it is scripture. It is the holy word of God. My opinions may or may not be correct, but the word of God will always be right. It will always be true. And it, you can always count on. It is faultless. That is God's holy word. God and his word are inseparable. And God is great, holy, righteous, his word is great, holy, and righteous. It is the expression of his being that he wants us to understand so we can live our lives to the utmost according to his direction that he has given us in his holy word. That being the case, I went ahead and put together an acrostic to help you think of revere and what that actually means. Now, I do start the acrostic with the word revere. I could have put respect there, but I want it to be a higher uh, denoted word than respect, and that is revere. In a very few words, it means to regard with honor to worship. E, express, how do we express our reverence toward him. We bow down. Sometimes we need to be still and know that he is God. Sometimes we need to celebrate and exalt him. But again, it's a part of worship. We are worshiping our God, whom we revere. We need to venerate God. This implies holding as holy or sacrosanct. Again, it is a type and style of worship. We venerate our God. We hold him above everything else. We do exclaim that he is great, that he is mighty, and we give him praise as the author of all things, including ourselves. We respect, yes, it is in here, we respect him. We respect him as our ultimate parent, our creator, our sovereign, our sustainer, our judge, and the author of our salvation. He is also our redeemer who purchased us back through Christ's blood. And we 
should espouse our great God in reverential terms because future generations need to know. What does espouse mean? It means to take up and support as a cause, become attached to, and it also has the idea that it will be passed on to future generations. Are we willing and are we actively pursuing that part of espousing our God? A big part of what God is calling us and our attention to, he says, I'm pleased with your sacrifices of praise. But, but God says to the wicked, why bother reciting my decrees and pretending to obey my covenant? For you refuse my discipline and treat my words like trash. This is the wicked. But there are some in some churches, even, that they treat the word like trash. Now they might not say that they do, but they take it out of context. They ignore much of it, and they don't know the word. They just don't know it. So they make up their own theology. They make up their own interpretations of the word. They may even make up their own sayings and think that they're biblical. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin used to do that. He'd put it in King James er, uh, English and publish it in a newspaper. Benjamin Franklin knew the word of God. In fact, 250 of our founding fathers, nearly all of them read through the scripture on an annual basis. So why is our nation and the culture class become so prevalent? Because we are a people who no longer knows the word of God as a nation. God is saying, be thankful. Repent, all of you who forget me, or I will tell you, tear you apart and no one will help you. But giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. If you keep to my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. This too is from Psalm 50, verses 22 and 23. So God wants us to remember what he has done. And he wants us to bring a, thank, a thanksgiving offering, if you will. He wants us to remember him and be thankful for all he has provided us. But giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. The words of our God. Will we take our cues from our culture or from the word of God? Is it so hard to spend 15 minutes a day in the Word of God so you can read through the full Word in one year? Is that too much a sacrifice to make? That's all it takes to read the Word of God through in a year. And if you do that and you have never done it before, you will be doing something that 97% of professing Christians have never done. That is a disgrace to our God and to our nation and to the prevailing culture. Only 3% have read through the word of God that proclaim Christianity as their faith. Now, our founding fathers knew it was important enough to read through it annually. Now we want to celebrate the living word, Jesus Christ. Not only did God provide the written word, but he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, the Christos, who took on flesh. He was always with God. In the beginning was God, and the word was God, and the word was with God. But then God asked Christ 
to take on human flesh and come and relate to us in the flesh as a human being. And Jesus became fully human. He lived as a human being. And he died a horrible death, not because he was guilty of anything, but because he chose to die that death to redeem all who would call him Savior and receive him as Lord. God is an awesome God. He loved us enough that he sent his son to die on that Roman cross to shed his blood so that we could be redeemed, purchased by that blood back into the family of God. Praise his holy name.